three rules. Okay. Yes. One, two right. clubs. Okay. Back as far as I want, right. or go back to the team. Yeah, that's fine. You can do that. Which way you think I should go? <laughs> <laughs> He was a magician. Uh, he could invent shots, create shots everywhere. His swashbuckling style, he had a go at everything. But Sevi uh, inspired people. He got them to stand up in front of their television and be screaming. The ultimate warrior on the golf course. do just about anything with any club in his bag. Right when you thought you had him, you know, the next thing you know, he'd chip in or get it up and down from an impossible place. A one-man army. That's what Sebby was like. He was awesome. Players would be on the putting green, and if he was teeing off 20 yards away, they'd all stop and watch or even wander out to get a better view. And, you know, that just simply didn't happen with any other player. As soon as he walked onto the first tee, he was ready to take it on. He's just a fantastic champion. He was the king. Second, nobody remember. You have to be the champion. And in my mind, I always been trained and I've always been dream and I always visualize myself as become a champion. Never crossed my mind to finish second. St Andrews 1984 and one of golf's most unforgettable moments. <laughs> Cavalier and charismatic, a matador and a matinee idol. Severiano Ballesteros was the greatest golfer in the world. But he was much more than that. To many, he was the inspiration. I thought, well, if he can do it, you know, I can do it. To others, a ferocious foe. He wouldn't give an answer, there's no doubt. Sevi was a role model. There was no one to touch him. He was, he was the, the best European, and he was the pioneer of the surge in European golf. He was a leader. You see it in his eyes, you know, his determination to win. Totally unpredictable. He's the type of player that you never knew was going to happen. But never, ever dull. I watched him do it again and again and again. It was phenomenal. Furiously determined, and with a talent beyond simple definition. Ballesteros was unique within his sport, and he knew it. As a golfer, more like a, a, an artist, more than a, a great player, you know, an artist. Sevi was born and raised in the small fishing village of Pedreña in northern Spain. Aged just eight and armed with a rusty three iron, the young boy dedicated himself to the game of golf, whenever and wherever he could. Because I was not allowed to play or practice on the golf course, I used to uh, play on the beach and uh, this is what I used to do. You can build your own golf course by using your imagination. Got it. <laughs> there wasn't a shot that he didn't try or play, you know, when he was a, in his youth down on the beach. When I have my, my, my free time, I used to come uh, over here and take my, my three iron with my uh, two or three balls. I never, I never get, got any more. Uh, and hit over the, those bushes into the green. And then, as soon as I hit it, I used to run quickly down to make sure nobody's steal the, the ball from me. And then come back, hit it again, come back, hit it again, come back until I get tired or until I feel happy with, with the shots. On the green too. Sevi exploded into the public consciousness in 1976. Yes. He chased American Johnny Miller home in the Open Championship at Royal Birkdale. The golfing world was waking up to a special talent. A great chip and run between the bunkers on 18. Man, that's a great shot. I was very impressed with that. 
you know, he was vaulted into the forefront of European golf and started going to the States, and he was brilliant every year after that for a long time, and uh, there was no one to touch him. By 1979, Ballesteros was Europe's number one player. The Open that year was held at Royal Lytham and St Anne's. Caddy David Musgrove told his Spanish charge the secret to success was to avoid the plentiful and perilous bunkers. Seve remained unfazed. I say, don't worry, David. I'm the best bunker player in the world. Don't worry. He could get it up and down from the trash can, from the garbage, from the car park, you name it, he could do it. Vintage Seve right there. Hale Irwin was Seve's playing partner for the final round when he hit his ball into a car park and still made birdie. I've been called as, as, the, as the car park champion, but uh, the people don't really realize that uh, because there were so many people show up to see the Open, that uh, they have to improvise a new car park just to the right side of the 16th. So that's why my ball end up over there. But that was, I mean, I have a free drop and I have a perfect entrance into the, into the pen. He was uh, Seve. Irwin, the reigning US Open champion, had no answer to the Spanish star's onslaught. At just 22, Seve was a major champion for the first time. It was the aura around the man, that was, that was it. The way he hit the ball, and look at those unbelievable follow-throughs that they show, you know, the ones that were the swingers like this. Nobody plays like that, it's a shame. Seve turned his attention to America, and more specifically, the US Masters at Augusta. I played it the first time in 1977. I just uh, say that, uh, you know, this golf course really suit uh, my game, and I think I'm going to win uh, one day. That day came in 1980. At one stage, he led the Masters and the world's greatest players by 10 shots. That was probably my best game uh, uh, in my whole career for, for one week. He was the youngest champion and the first in a line of many European winners. Obviously enthralled by his performances in the, in the Masters and other tournaments and uh, I thought, well, if he can do it, you know, I can do it. Augusta is the, is the type of golf course that demand uh, all the shots that uh, you can possibly have in your back. Uh, you have to be a complete player to win the, the Masters, I think. To prove the point, he claimed a second green jacket in 1983 and there should have been more. In 1986, when his father, Baldomero, fell sick, Seve made a promise. This year, I'm going to win the Masters for you. Baldomero passed away before the tournament began. Seve led by three shots on the final day, but faltered, allowing Jack Nicklaus to win his sixth Masters. It was great, uh, the way Jack Nicklaus played and, and uh, you know, how, how good he played the the final holes, but uh, the bitterness that I have inside my body because I didn't win for my father. If Seve had a passion for beating the home stars at the US Masters, it paled in comparison to his ferocious desire in the biennial Ryder Cup matches, Europe versus America. He gave his heart and soul to that event. It was his real passion to beat America. You know, at that year, Americans didn't like him. You know, the press gave him a real hard time. So he really wanted to beat Americans. Whenever that press guy called him Steve, that was the end of America's chances. He hated to be called Steve, and this guy just continually called him Steve. And he didn't like that, and uh, that, that grew inside him until it was uh, very strong feelings against them. He just hated everybody like when it came to match playing Riley Cups, you know, he, he just such spirit and determination to beat him. He wouldn't exchange too many pleasantries. He was just delighted he was on your side. Seve's Ryder Cup career began in 1979, when Europe was well beaten. He then fell out with the European tour over appearance money. But in 1982, Captain Tony Jacklin stepped in. They banned him from playing in 81, and he was arguably the best player in the world. So I talked to him and got him back 
uh, on board and uh, once on board he was as keen as, as I was to show that we could turn the thing around and you know the, the rest history. The United States won again in 1983 but as far as Seve was concerned the moral victory had belonged to Europe. We got so close there we, we lost for a point and we were sitting there all down and thinking wow and everyone was working you know the permutations what could have been and then Seve came in and we said we might have to celebrate this is a victory for us and he was like what? Why are you so sad why are you you had to is down, you know. You don't really realize that this is for us like a victory. It's the first time that we being with a chance to beat the Americans, even on the American soil. You know, we have some come so close. It was a big turnaround to the belief, and he was right. Two years later at the Belfry, the United States were beaten for the first time in 28 years. Sebi the talisman led from the front. If there had been any doubt, his American opponents now knew exactly what they were up against. He sometimes he was tough to play because he, he seemingly would hit it all over the place and beat you. And it's very mentally debilitating to your opponent. <laughs> the 1987 matches witnessed the birth of the greatest pairing in Ryder Cup history. By Asteros and Spanish compatriot, Jose Maria Olazabal. You know, that was a tough duo, and, and Jose's game was very similar to Seve's. Uh, you know, just phenomenal short game, uh, and they, you know, between the two of them, you, you expect one of them to make a putt on the green every hole. It was like, you know, two of them putting at the same time, uh, one of them liable to make one, and uh, uh, obviously a, a very, a very tough team to beat. So tough, they almost beat themselves. We had uh, like a, a 10 footer putt uh, on the 18th green. Uh, we only needed two putts uh, uh, to tie the hole and win the match. And I said, yes, yes. OK, don't you worry. Don't worry, don't worry. I've got it, I've got it. So I hit it. As soon as the ball leaves the club face, I'm thinking, well, that's, that's going to be very fast. Touches the edge of the hole, keeps on rolling. I look at the ball, I couldn't believe it. I said, my goodness. That was really fast. I just can't believe it, you know. That's not the part I wanted to have. <laughs> I look at him and he, and he said to me, what have you done? <laughs> what have you done? How many times I told you that was fast? I say, yeah, 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 but I never thought it was that, that fast. Once I made a putt, uh, coming back, I approached him and said to him, don't you ever do that again to me. <laughs> it was funny. They both have this uh, determination and fighting spirit. Uh, no other duo has ever had, and, you know, as Ryder Cup partnerships go, I don't think there's been anybody finer. Seve and Oli went on to play 15 times together, winning 11 matches and losing only twice. We fight and how good we, we were uh, in match play, and. Uh, yeah, he, he knew, I knew, and, and the opponents knew. So that was uh, uh, some kind of advantage before the, uh, the yeah. match was started. It's, it's true. Savi alone was equally intimidating. In 1987, his singles opponent was world number one Curtis Strange. But Savi beat him to seal Europe's first ever win on American soil. Nothing better uh, feeling or better taste than uh, to beat the best. You always want to be the best. For the best part of two decades, Seve Ballesteros was the number one name in golf. There were victories all over the globe, including five world match play titles. He won at least one event every year on the European tour from 1976 to 1992. Be right, be right ball, please. Be right. He had a phenomenal passion. He had as great a passion as I've ever seen for a golfer. And that is one of the essential ingredients, is to have that passion. There are people that dream about being champions, and they're doers. Uh, and he was a doer. By the mid-80s, Seve had helped to redress the balance of power in the Ryder Cup, but was still chasing major titles. In 1984, the Open Championship was played at St Andrews, the home of golf. 
For Ballesteros, a victory at the legendary course in Scotland would be the ultimate achievement. St Andrews is a piece of art. To win the Open in St Andrews in front of 80,000 people, to beat Tom Watson, one of the best players of all time, is unbelievable. He had tremendous ability and great touch and feel. Uh, the, uh, and as, as a competitor, I always thought that you know, Sebi was, uh, uh, was the fellow I had to beat when I, when I teed it up there along with Nicholas. On the final day, with Watson in trouble on the 17th, Ballesteros, one hole ahead, had a putt to win the Open. That ball just seemed to sort of look at eyes on it, just sort of got near the hole and bum, and you could see him almost forcing that ball in. Heavy was heavy, you know. I think the pumping of the fist on the 18th at St Andrews is always um, a picture in my mind for many years. That was typical of him, and I think it's the finest celebration I've ever seen. His reaction was just brilliant. Just like a matador. It was just wonderful. I was on the 18th green when he, when he rolled the pop. Special. Severiano Ballesteros. At the age of 27, Seve had two Open Championships and two green jackets. It seemed certain he would go on to dominate the game. Incredibly, it was four years until he won his next major. It would be his last. In 1988, the Open was back at Lytham, the scene of Seve's first major title nine years earlier. For three rounds, he jostled for the lead with Nick Price and defending champion Nick Faldo. But typically, Seve saved his best for the final day. That was something else. That really was like seeing a true artist at work. When you see a guy playing on a day, whatever, whatever sport, or when they have a day when they're just unbelievable, I think that was his finest day. Watching him in the, uh, the open at Lytham, you know, that nice little chip from the side of the green there, up the stone dead. Seve shot a spectacular last round 65 and sealed victory with a touch of class on the 18th. Even he felt it was his best round of golf in a major. The following years saw his powers fade, but Ballesteros was still capable of magic. Caddy Billy Foster saw more than his share, including one shot in Switzerland in 1993 that he could scarcely believe. There was a tree right behind him when he's looking up over this wall and I thought, what are you doing, like, you know, just chip it out, you know. She says, uh, Billy, I, uh, I see this shot here and he's, I'm looking at this gap that's about this big, over this eight-foot wall with half a backswing, through these fir trees, over the swimming pool. I'm like, he finally lost the plot, like, you know, I said, please, just chip it out sideways. So I tried three or four times and he just gave me that. It's OK, I have this shot here. And sure enough, he got in there with a the pitching wedge Half a backswing, up, over the wall, through the foot gap, over the swimming pool, over 50-foot pine trees, and finished two or three yards short of the green. It was an unbelievable shot. And then he chipped it in for birdie. It was too complete. Some kind of magnetism always show up during the round, whatever it was on the first roll, or was on the 16th, on the 18th, or whatever, always something happened that it was very unusual. Fittingly, Seve's final tour victory was the 1995 Spanish Open. That same year, he was among the supporting cast, as Nick Faldo's heroics helped Europe regain the Ryder Cup. But Seve's passion remained undiminished. I hold the putt, turn around, and there was Seve balling. I grabbed him, and I mean, and, uh, and he went into a tear, you know? No, he was crying before me, wasn't he? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, when I cry, it's because somebody else always makes me cry. 
He'd said to me, you are a great champion. For me, that was one of the nicest moments in my career. Two years later, Seve was instrumental in bringing the Ryder Cup to Spain for the first time. And as captain on home soil, he was more determined to win than ever. He wanted to play every shot. He wanted to play Langer's shot. He wanted to play Falder, my shot. He wanted to play everybody's shot. You speak to some of the guys who played, I think they, they preferred he hadn't quite tried to play the shots for him. But I mean, as, as a team member, there was no one quite like him. He was a motivator. He was, you know, I would not have wanted to have been Tom Kite and faced him at Valderrama in the Ryder Cup. I mean, holy cow, talk about a hometown, you know, benefit. But there could only be one outcome. He will forever have a have a mark in the game, and um, you know to be to be part of that winning team at, at Valderrama was was certainly a huge privilege. To bring the cup into your country, being the captain, and um, and win the Ryder Cup is what else you can ask. Seve won more than 80 times around the world, yet the 90s were unkind to him, and his body was ailing. A decade on from Valderrama, and after turning 50, he flirted briefly with the seniors tour in America, before deciding that enough was enough. I make uh, probably the most difficult uh, decision of my uh, career as a player, and I decide uh, to retire. A bigger battle lay ahead. In October 2008, Seve was diagnosed with a brain tumour and underwent life-saving surgery. He fought with all his might. Life is like a uh, sport. You have to fight every day and the key is, is just never give up. Just like in, uh, in the old days. <laughs> It was one battle Seve could never win. He died at home in Spain in May 2011. Golf has always been fun. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but golf has always been fun. The good thing about golf is that when you play golf, you always produce one or two shots that uh, it, it really it makes you feel good and it makes you think, oh, you know, I think I'll come back tomorrow. The legacy of Seve Ballesteros looms large. More than anyone, this self-taught champion brought golf to the masses. After Seve, it was no longer a sport just for the elite. He brought fire and passion, risk and reward. His genius transcended the sport and left enough memories for a dozen lifetimes. Started off as fierce competitors, which is natural, uh, and then, uh, then obviously Ryder Cups bring you together. There was a moment we stood on the tee together and he said, uh, you know, we should be mates. He was just a kid in his village. <sighs> He has achieved things that no any other European will ever achieve. He did it with artistry and passion, passion. You don't get characters like him anymore. Someone that could walk into a room and you didn't have to look around, you knew he was in. You knew something had happened behind you. What's happened? Oh yeah, must be Seve. He was a legend of the game. Stay still if you don't mind, please. <laughs> he just simply loved the game of golf. And he loved people who watched him playing the game of golf. He was a genius. I create uh, a lot of shots and I produce a lot of shots uh, throughout my career than most people. And probably that's why the majority of the people always love to watch Sergio Ballesteros playing in the golf course.